Heavenly Father, um, what kind of a work is it that you must accomplish in our hearts that we would be able to say in the midst of great loss, um, it is well with my soul. It's easy to say that in great blessing, but Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts that we might be content and happy in you regardless of what this broken world um, brings our way. So, Father, we once again this morning cast ourselves upon you. We open your word before our hearts that we might draw near to you in these words. We pray that this would be indeed worship of your son, Jesus. We pray that you would stabilize these frail lives that we live and that you would show us once again the the bedrock of Jesus Christ that we stand on before you, our holy God. And we pray that you might open our eyes to see how ascended and exalted and full he is, that we might be distracted by him and forget for a little while the ways that we feel life is empty here. Father, thank you for making us into a church. Thank you for preserving this church for so many years. Thank you that even in the midst of the trials that even we ourselves brought on this church as men, you were greater than all and you sustained this church. We pray that you would continue to build up this church and that we would be glorifying to you and that we would be an encouragement to one another as a family and as a body. Father, will you bless this time now as your word is open and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You can take your Bibles this morning and open them up to Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. If someone asked you, what do you do in your church? How would you hear that question, first of all? How would you answer that question? What do you do in your church? You might hear it first in such a way that you would answer like, wait, you mean like, what's our church like on Sundays? No, we don't, don't mean the question that way. The question is, is much more personal. What do you do in your church? You might say, oh, and think, well, not much, really. I mean, I'm not in leadership or anything. I'm not a pastor. I don't know how you would answer that question. How would you answer the question, what do you do in your church? I hope by the end of our time together, hopefully you'll have a a clearer answer of what the New Testament says you must do in your church. And if you need to take some steps to be more aligned with what the New Testament says a believer must do in his or her church, well, hopefully you'll even have an idea of what some practical steps might look like to move in that direction. Today's message is the third installment in our intermittent series that we've been doing uh, on what a biblical philosophy of ministry looks like for a local church, but in particular for this church. We are purposefully here and there along the way interrupting our series in Romans to spell this out clearly from Scripture. What is a biblical philosophy of ministry? The New Testament, just so you know, is not silent on this, on how to do church. It has plenty to say about what the church is and what it must be and do and why it must be what it is, and why it must do what it must do. What Smed has said to us already in the first two installments of this is a biblical philosophy of ministry is kind of like that unseen spiritual DNA code within the church that then determines the visible characteristics, the visible practices, the visible features of the church. It tells you why we are what we are as a church, and why we do what we do as a church. So there have already been two sermons in this series, and Smed has done those. The first one was Preach the Word, and the second one was Shepherd the Sheep, or Shepherd the Flock, 
and you can get those on our website. And today we're going to do Equip the Saints. So this is going to tell you what we believe the New Testament says to us about what this church must do with the believers in this church. And it will answer the question, what do you do in the church, in your church? Now, before we jump into Equip the Saints, let me just remind you of some of the goals that SMED has laid out for us in this series. We need to know what a biblical philosophy of ministry is, first of all, again, just so that we know why we do what we do. Um, We need to make it clear from elders to first-time visitors in our church why we do what we do. It's possible to be here for some time and to very easily pick up on the particular practices of this church, like we do communion every Sunday, and you can very quickly pick out those things, but you may not know why we do them. In fact, I'd be willing to say that there are many of you here who have been here for a while, and you still don't know why we do what we do. We do it, and you've seen it, but you don't know why we do it. Well, what we want to do is have this series remove any guessing on any of that. And we need to know what a biblical philosophy of ministry is, secondly, so we know why we don't do other things. Somebody might ask, you might even ask, why doesn't this church do and fill in the blank? Well, this series can at least help answer that question in part. We need to know what a biblical philosophy of ministry is, thirdly, so you can hold your elder pastor leadership accountable to this biblical philosophy of ministry. This series is the lifting up of the standard before this body. This is the standard that the elder pastors have set for themselves. And if you ever see us deviate from this standard, your elders need to hear from you. And we need to know what a biblical philosophy of ministry is, fourthly, so you can pray for your elder pastor leadership, therefore. Pray for your elders to maintain a, an unwavering commitment to these things. We need to know what a biblical philosophy of ministry is. So fifthly, you can pray for other churches in this valley who are committed to the same New Testament biblical DNA. You need to pray for other churches to become more committed to this New Testament biblical DNA. And pray for us if perhaps God might be pleased to do so, that he might even expand our opportunities to be a source of encouragement to other churches who are struggling, going through hard times that we might even be able to provide them counsel and advice, maybe even provide them pastoral leadership at some point. This valley needs more than Grace Bible Church. This valley is big, and it needs countless churches committed to a biblical philosophy of ministry. We need to know what a biblical philosophy of ministry is, sixthly, to help you just be a resource for others who are looking for a good church wherever they are. How will they know Which church or which kind of church is the right one to throw themselves into? Do you make the decision based on the church's music? Or do you make the decision based on the kids' programs they offer or the social issues that the church is committed to? Or or are there some other measurements to make in the decision? And lastly, we need to know what a biblical philosophy of ministry is to prepare you to be and do what only you must be and do in this church. It's easy to be someone who primarily lives on the consumer side only. And if that's been you, you need to see something more from Scripture today. Although many churches don't mind consumer Christians only, as long as they give, they may be even programmed to that end, you're going to see that the New Testament says otherwise for you in the local church. You must be And you must do much, much more in the church than merely consume what the church provides you. So let's jump in. Number one this morning, equip the saints. I want to give you the big, big picture. The big, big picture in Ephesians. Let me show you where this statement is found in our text, equipping the saints. It's found in verse four, uh, chapter four, verse 12. For the equipping of the saints. There it is. But what we need to grasp first is really the larger agenda that the statement sits in, that it, that it serves. The agenda that for the equipping of the saints sits in, it's actually an enormous agenda. Equipped saints are swept up into the biggest, most grand agenda 
that the universe will ever experience. That's a pretty big statement to make. And it's easy to justify it. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. This is Paul's first prayer. And you know, you know this already. If you've looked at Paul's prayers, we don't pray like Paul does yet. We need to. But look how he ends his prayer. Chapter 1, verse 22. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Verse 22, he put all things in subjection under his feet. God the Father put all things down in subjection under Christ's feet. So second place, third place, fourth place powers and authorities are all looking up at the soles of resurrected victorious Jesus boots. And, verse 22, he gave him as head over all things. So the Father gave Jesus as head over all things. So everything and everybody and every power gets pushed down below victorious kingly Jesus. And Jesus gets raised up to the top to the head position over all things. And as such an exalted one like that, he was given as such to the church? Verse 22. To the church, to us. That alone is remarkable. The most exalted, the most powerful, the most victorious one belongs to us. And then we get described in verse 23, which is his body. The church is his body. So he is the exalted head over all things, but he's also our head. As our head of our body, he is the head over all things. Think about that. As the head of our body, he is the head over all things. We're swept up into something pretty big. And notice what is said about the church, verse 23, which is the fullness of him. Okay, so right now... People can't see our head, who is over all things. But they can see his body in and through local assemblies of true churches, true churches. There's a lot today that calls itself a church, and it's not. But true churches, they can see his body in and through those local assemblies all over around the world. His plan right now is that his fullness be seen not directly from him as head, but through his body. And he is described at the end of verse 23 as the one who fills all in all. So Grace Bible Church, we are swept up in We are within that massive, all things being filled agenda that Jesus Christ is doing. That is the most incredible event that this universe could ever see. Angels long to look into these kinds of things. The creator, savior, king filling all things. And now, right now, we reveal something of his fullness as his body? Now, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and following tells us how the church came into existence, that through his bloody death at the cross, believers in Messiah Jesus are then assembled into a new body, a new man, regardless of whether they are Jews who believe in Messiah Jesus or Gentiles who believe in Messiah Jesus. And then I want you to notice over in chapter 3, verse 19, Paul's next prayer. He prays in verse 19 that we would know the love of Christ. Knowing that magnificent love of our Savior, it's beyond knowledge, it seems. That's what Paul says in verse 19, which surpasses knowledge. How can you plumb the depths of that love and completely know it? Nevertheless, Paul prays that we would know it. Why? Why do we know this, need to know this love of Christ? Verse 19 so that you might be filled up to all the fullness of God. So remember, we are the fullness of him, of Jesus as his body. And knowing Christ's love for us is what helps fill us up 
to that fullness of God. How? How does the church progress into that fullness of Christ? Well, that's where Ephesians 4 provides more clarity and description. Look with me at verse 7 of chapter 4. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, there he is up really high, right? He led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts in that ascension. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is himself also. He who ascended far above all the heavens, there he is again, way up high. So that, why did he ascend there? So that he might fill all things. And he gave. Verse 11. You see, Jesus Christ, the victorious, ascended, exalted king who fills all things, he gave gifts in that ascension. He gave gifts to mere mortals. So the way he is going to get to filling all things with himself has something to do with him giving gifts to men. And the gifts that will do that in particular are the ones he gave to help birth the church, to establish the church, and then see the church expand. In verse 11, he gave some as apostles, and he gave some as prophets, and he gave some as evangelists, and he gave some as pastors and teachers. Notice what follows the last gift of pastor-teacher in verse 12. What is this pastoral instruction? What is this instructive shepherding in the church for? Verse 12, it is for the equipping of the saints. And just what do saints or believers need to be equipped for? Verse 12, well, they need to be equipped for the work of service. Well, and what will that work of service done by believers achieve? Verse 12, well, to the building up of that body of Christ. Remember everything that's been said about his body. It must be built up. Well, how long should this building up of the body take place? Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And what will that unity move us toward? Verse 13, to a mature man, a mature body to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So there it is. This is the big picture. The measure of our church's body status, the measure of our maturity as a church, it belongs to the fullness of Jesus Christ. It must correspond to his fullness. It must point to the fullness of Jesus Christ. And what happens to you in this body matters. You must be equipped for the work of service. Why? Because that contributes toward the building up of this body. So you see how we do church, why we do church, it matters. Listen, church is not a toy for men to play with. Church is not a thing for ambitious men to manipulate to their own ends. The world seeing right now something of the fullness of Jesus Christ through the church, it depends not just on pastors teaching. It does. But it depends on you, believer, being equipped, you being trained for the work of service that builds up this body that is the fullness of him, the one who fills all things. What do you do in your church? You know what you could say? You could say, I labor to make the fullness of Jesus Christ seen through my little church. That's what I do in my church. That would be a good biblical answer. That's big. That is a big, big picture of what God is doing in and through local churches that follow the script. 
Who knows what is happening in and through the church that follows the script of an ambitious man? Notice with me, secondly, let's now talk about the details. Number two, equip the saints. Let's look at the details in more specific in verses 11 to 13. In verse 11, it says, the ascended one gave some as apostles and some as prophets. These are New Testament prophets. These are not, this is not a reference to the Old Testament prophets. The reason you know that is because the word apostles comes first, and then it's followed by the word prophets, and so he means the apostles and the New Testament prophets who came. These were gifts the ascended victorious Christ gave to the church to, first of all, just make known and make clear that the believing Jew and the believing Gentile were not to join the worship and the fellowship of the synagogue nor of the temple, but they were to go outside of that Messiah-rejecting institution and be drawn into a new gathering, a new believing entity together, believing Jew, believing Gentile, entirely on equal spiritual footing in a new assembly called the church. The Old Testament did not direct them to do that. They needed new revelation from God to know this. God in Paul's day was adding this new revelation to his Old Testament revelation, and the gifts of apostle and New Testament prophets were the ones through which that new revelation of the church came. That's what Ephesians 2, verse 11 through chapter 3, verse 13 is all about. So again, the ascended, victorious Christ gave to the church these two gifts to first of all, just simply explain and reveal what this new gathering of Messiah believers would be and what they would do. They're foundational gifts. And then verse 11, he also gave some as evangelists. As the foundation of that church was being laid by the apostles and the New Testament prophets, the ascended Christ gave another gift to assist them. The evangelist was not a receiver of new revelation, from God, like the New Testament prophet or apostle, the evangelist was more like Philip in Acts chapter 8 and chapter 21. Those who preached the gospel in outlying areas beyond the walls of the current church, baptizing those who believed and then moving on again and again and again and again. It's interesting, though, Paul's disciple Timothy was not gifted as an evangelist, Paul exhorted him to do the work of an evangelist in 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. It's important to note that at the end of the great apostle's life, he was urging his young pastor protege, Timothy, toward the work of an evangelist and not toward the ministry of apostle or New Testament prophet. Those gifts by that time, as Paul is drawing near to the end of his life, as many others had by that point as apostles. They have served their foundational purpose for bringing the New Testament revelation to sit alongside the Old Testament revelation. But evangelism, beyond the walls of the church, that never stops. So the pastor needed to do the work of an evangelist. And verse 11, he gave some as pastors and teachers. Now the word some there stands before not just the word pastors, but be also before the word teachers, indicating that pastors and teachers are linked as a unit somehow. Pastors are the ascended king's gift to the church to shepherd the church with the teaching of the word of God. Pastors take that New Testament revelation given to us by the apostles. Pastors take that and they shepherd the church by teaching it, through teaching that word. And it's very interesting to note, in Paul's day, as the church is coming into existence across the Roman Empire, notice these gifts that he mentioned here that the ascended Christ gave. They, they primarily deal with the word of God. Apostles and New Testament prophets brought God's new words into existence before the church as they wrote And evangelists ran with that apostolic revelation, and they ran with that gospel to the ends of the Roman Empire. And pastors and teachers remained behind in the local gathering of the churches to shepherd the churches with the teaching of those words from God. So again, what's the big idea here? The body of Christ, the local church, we are the fullness of God, the fullness of Christ 
on earth positionally. That's what we are. And we're supposed to grow into that fullness. So we need to become what we are. And to help us grow into it, our ascended victorious king who fills all things, he gave gifts so we might know that we are the body of Christ and so that we might have God's word which tells us how to grow into that fullness. That fullness is found down in verse 13. Do you see that? We have to grow until we are reach the, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. I mean, we need to be measured up to the fullness of Christ. How do evangelists, how do pastor teachers armed with God's word move the church toward fullness of Christ on earth? How do we do that? The ascended Christ gave some as pastors and teachers. Verse 12, what does it say? For the equipping of the saints. That's how we get there. If the ultimate goal for the church is the fullness that is described in verse 13, then the immediate goal for the church is the equipping of the saints in verse 12. You cannot get to the ultimate goal without first going through the immediate goal of equipping the saints. And that is the responsibility of the pastor teachers of the local church. At Grace Bible Church, that's not just me. It's not just Smed. It's not just me, Smed, and Josh, who are the elders who are paid full time. But it includes every single one of our eight elder pastors. Our role as elder pastors is to shepherd with God's word for the equipping of the saints. The word equipping in verse 12, prior to the New Testament, it was a medical term that was used for the setting of a bone. But it came to mean more generally just kind of like the idea of preparation. So maybe the idea is something of training, for the training of the saints, for the dis disciplining of the saints in the sense of becoming more disciplined, more prepared, more trained, more equipped for something. So pastors who shepherd through teaching God's word aim for the believers to be equipped, to be prepared, to be trained. So don't miss this. The ascended victorious king who fills all things with himself and who on earth right now wants his body to reach the measurement of his fullness does not bypass you to get there. The body of Christ can't get to the fullness unless you are equipped, unless you are trained, unless you are prepared. We can't get there if you are ill-equipped, untrained, undisciplined. And the shepherds of the church with their Bibles open are a gift from Christ to the church for that equipping. Equipping for what? Look at verse 12. For the work of service. The word work is active work. And we need the next word to help understand the activity. It's the work of service. So it's servant activity. It's active work characterized by humble service. Humility is built into the word service, is it not? We all are not being trained. We're not all being equipped for ruling on high from a throne. But instead, we are becoming disciplined in our humble, active service. And we need training for that. We need equipping for that. Meaning, it doesn't just come naturally for us to do that. We have to be disciplined to do it, equipped to do it. We need shepherd pastors with the Bible open teaching us the word of God so that we become disciplined for this humble act of service. Again, why? Why? because we have to reach the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. Well, how do we get to there? Verse 12, what does this humble work of service we've been equipped for accomplish? To the building up of the body of Christ. We all won't become that mature man, that mature body, if we're being torn apart. We have to be built up. We have to be assembled and put together and strengthened together. We need to be edified. So when you become disciplined, when you become trained, when you become equipped for humble service in this body, then 
And only then does this body get the chance to be built up. And that must keep going on and on over and over and over again, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity. This is the unity that it is designed by Christ for his body. It is a unity, verse 13, focused on the faith until we all attain to the unity of the faith. That means the content or the truth that we must believe, that we must trust. It's not our act of believing that unifies us. It is the content, the material, the truth that must be believed. That's the faith. And we need to have a unity of that faith. And we need to have a unity that is focused on the knowledge of the Son of God, verse 13. We need to know him who is our head, the ascended one, the victorious one. Our unity is focused on, it is dependent on knowing the Son of God. And so what does that tell you? That helps you understand what the shepherd pastors must be teaching the saints in the church. Pastors must teach what is to be believed in the Bible. What does the Bible say must be believed? What is the faith we must cast ourselves onto? And pastors must teach who Jesus Christ is. Who is he? And as pastors teach believers that, we all become trained, we become equipped for humble, active service, which builds up the body, and that unifies us in the content we believe, and in, it unifies us around what we know about Jesus. And that church body, where all of that is taking place, that's a mature man, a mature body. Verse 13, and that is a measure, a, a specification, which mirrors or looks like or corresponds to the fullness of Jesus Christ. Those are the details of what it means to equip the saints. Now, let, let's move thirdly to just some simple, um, immediate kind of conclusions to think about. Some very simple summary conclusions so far. The church must have shepherds capable of handling accurately God's word. Every local church must have shepherds who can handle the word of God. The word of God must be in a central place in the church with a shepherd's hand on it. Instructing the sheep, shepherding the sheep, the saints, lifting it high so we all know what we must believe and so that we can know our Savior, our King. That is the shepherding call with the Word of God to unify the body around the Word. Here's the contrast. Look at verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children. Well, that's kind of a contrast to a mature man. The child is one who has not reached maturity yet. And then watch this, the opposite of unity. We are no longer to be children tossed here, tossed there. That's scattered. That's not unity. Scattered. Well, what is it that scatters the body of Christ? Look at it. Tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Bad teaching. That's a church where either the shepherds started moving the Bible off to the side a long time ago or there are no pastors who take care of the word of God before the people and now the people are listening and believing anything that comes along and it scatters God's people. It doesn't unify them. They get scattered by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, there it is, the word of God, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. The church must have shepherds capable of handling accurately the word of God. The church, another conclusion, the church must have humble, active service mindset. We have to have that mindset together, humble, active service. That's the work of service. We should be self-emptying believers, not self-esteeming believers. Pouring ourselves out in service, 
Another simple conclusion, individual believers must also have a corporate or a body mindset. Every single one of us as individuals needs to have a body mindset. I must be concerned not just for my own individual growth, it's very important, but that certainly is not everything. I need to be concerned for the growth of the body, which then also means my life has to be connected to this body. Which means I love the local church. There are Christians today who say that they, they love Jesus, but they don't love the church. Is there any evidence in here that you can decapitate the body, the head from the body? That is a, that is a myth in the mind of the one who says it. Most of all, conclusion, my ultimate distraction, my ultimate devotion is my exalted king and savior and him getting all that he deserves through the church right now. And if his desire is for the world to see right now something of his fullness through a little church family in Tempe, well then whatever self-emptying act of service I can render, I'll do it because he's mine. He was given to me in this church. Let me put them, maybe these conclusions, maybe in a negative way. The church that keeps pushing the word of God to the sidelines is a church that is falling short of both the immediate and the ultimate goal for the church. Getting equipped is, is a stunted thing in that church. The church that pr pushes for the pastor or the pastors to be more of a celebrity than a shepherd is a church that is falling short of both the immediate and ultimate goal for the church. And the church that pushes for attendance or pushes for consumerism or pushes for entertainment but not humble active service of each individual member is one that is falling short in the immediate and the ultimate goal for the church. And the church that pushes primarily for unifying the church around social issues in the community but not taking care of these things is a church that is falling short of the immediate goal and the ultimate goal. And the church certainly that pushes the church to be socially fun but not spiritually full is falling short of the immediate goal of equipping the saints for the work of service and the ultimate goal of reaching the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. Those are some initial conclusions. Now let's talk lastly here this morning, number four, about our practices. This is specific to Grace Bible Church. Equip the saints, our practices. This is our how what we've been talking about is our unseen DNA, but it works itself out into very visible practices and habits and pursuits and features. So let me give you some of them. I, they're not gonna be up on the screen. If you wanna listen and, and then try to write them down as we go, that's fine, but you may wanna go back and listen and, and write them down more so later. What, is, what are the visible features that come from this DNA? First, this is why we have a thorough pastoral presence in this church. This is why we have eight pastor elders, and this is why we want more qualified men like that. And this is why the pastor elders in this church do much, much more than merely make business decisions or financial decisions. We have to do that, and we love to do that, and we will do that. But this is why this church is not run by these men like this is a corporation or a brand. This is a body. And this is why we shepherd this body this way. It has to spiritually grow. Another visible feature from our less visible DNA is this is why the word of God is taught, why it is preached, why it is explained from the pulpit here on Sundays into our Development ministries like Build for Men and Wellspring for Women. This is why we teach the Bible right now over on the other side of the building to every possible age kid who can sit there and listen to anything. And this is why the Bible is preached to middle school and high school age kids and student ministries. This is why the Word of God has a central place in our small groups. This is why we have a book ministry right outside there. It's not a huge library. There are specific chosen select titles that we think will help you be equipped for the work of service to build up this body. 
books that will help you know what must be believed, books that will reveal more to you Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is why we want, under the shepherding eldership of this church, a biblical counseling ministry in this church so that the Bible can be opened between two believers sitting next to each other trying to help each other grow in our sanctification. This is why the single adults ministry tries to keep the word central in any of its gatherings it has. This is why personal one-on-one meetings often have a Bible open on the table at a coffee shop between a brother and a brother in Christ, between two sisters. We must be equipped for the work of service from this word so that we can build up the body so that the body can reach the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You can say that, it's like, I don't even know what that means. That is so lofty, that is so big. This is also why we are concerned to have a life-to-life connection in this body, to one another in this church with our Bibles open. And so this is why we ask all who want to make Grace Bible Church their home to pursue formal membership. We want the strongest connection possible that a a believer could make to this church. We want a life-to-life connection. This is why small group participation matters in this church. This is why we push for such a high uh, participation rate in it. Our lives must come together. They must connect. You have to put your humble service into action there in your little corner of the church family that you live in. And this is why even in our development ministries like Build and Wellspring, we, we have discussion groups so that we can put our lives closer together to see how we're progressing in this humble act of service from the word of God into the lives of others. And again, this is why we want a biblical counseling ministry that equips a believer to connect his or her life with another believer with the Bible open so that they can help each other grow in Christ to be built up. Now, there are some specific tools within this that we have that are a part of our practice here that can help you selflessly labor, help you sacrifice yourself as you invest in the lives of others. We can use the, the disciplines that we talk about in Build and Wellspring, the three foundational ones first. Here's how you can sacrifice yourself. Take the time, put your life and all the busyness on pause and take the time and sacrifice to sit with somebody else and ask these kinds of questions. How are you shepherding your heart right now with the word of God so that you know the God of the word better? How is that going for you? That takes time. That takes practice. It takes energy. It's humble. Nobody else may even see it. You may be rebuffed, but do it. It's a humble act of service that helps build up somebody else. How are you doing in that? Are you, are you growing in your equipping of that? Do you feel more equipped to shepherd your heart with God's word now than you did a year ago? If not, how can I help you? Will you help me? I need help. The second question in build the disciplines. How are you shepherding your household relationships with the word of God? The first place of impact must be in your household. How are you doing there? What does that look like? You're going to be stepping into somebody's life when you say that. I want to know what's it like in your household. That may not be warmly received the first time. It also might be just what somebody is waiting for somebody to ask them. The believer who really wants to grow. It takes time to do that. It takes sacrifice to do that. Pause your life and and empty yourself out in the life of another with these kinds of questions. A third question in Build and Wellspring. How are you bringing the gospel and the word of... That's the core question one, isn't it? No, that's not, it's not. It's similar. How are you bringing the gospel and the word of God to bear on others in this church and beyond this church? How are you stepping into the lives of others with the word of God? Do you need any help with that? Do you need some ideas? Do you need some creativity of how you can do that? I know your time is limited. What might it look like for you? Sundays only? Or do you have every night of the week open? 
Help each other sacrifice to serve one another. How can I help build you up? Our core questions do the same type of thing. These are ways for you to sacrifice yourself in a humble, active, servant way so that you can build up others in the church. Let me just read these core questions to you from that many in our small groups use. What is God teaching you about himself from his word and how is your life changing as a result? That would get right at the heart of Ephesians 4. Equip the saints. Second question, how have you seen God answering prayer? What prayers are you currently asking God to answer? Listen, this is humble acts of service in the life of another. Thirdly, how is God using you in the process of evangelism to draw people to himself? Where you're living, are you bold for Christ? Fourthly, what sins has God revealed to you so that you may repent of them to return to him? In light of the grace realities in the gospel, what does your repentance toward God need to look like? The biblical counseling training that's going to start up, what you're going to learn there, great tools given to you so that you might learn how to selflessly wring yourself out in the life of another to help build them up so that the body grows so that the fullness of Christ is seen through the measurement of this maturity here. Listen, it's this kind of purposeful life-to-life connection with the Bible open that makes a body grow. If this kind of purposeful life-to-life connection does not exist, does it really matter what other things we do as a church? We can't be a hollow church, but very active doing lots of things. We have to be this first and foremost, because the fullness of Jesus Christ is at stake in this world right now to be seen. This is at the heart of the existence of the local church, of this local church. And then, what? you know what? Some who are doing all of that well also need to physically serve to help facilitate equipping for others. Anytime the body gets together, um, they make a mess, and it needs to be picked up. And anytime they're going to come together, things need to be cleaned up and ready for them. You have no idea what happens in this room before you ever come in, most of you. And you don't need to know. And you know what? The ones who do it for you, they don't want you to know. It's a humble, invisible, active service In your home, before people ever come in to be in your small group, it takes hospitality to make it ready so that when they come in, it's just easy. It's easy to come in and sit down and open the Bible and encourage one another, challenge each other. So people who are doing all of what we've been talking about well, they also need to serve and help this church in physical ways, set up, tear down, um, hospitality. And we could go on. So here's that question again, you remember? What do you do in the church? How would you answer that? Can you put where you do serve right now? If it's in Wellspring, if it's in Build, if it's in Setup and Teardown, if it's in your small group, you're assisting a co-leader or a leader, you, you, you teach NGM, you know, you just assist in the threes and help them all stay in one spot. Can you think of your service now, your humble act of service in a bigger, better way? This is why we do what we do. This is our often unseen spiritual DNA that works itself out in visible features in this church. You need to know what you do in the church, what the New Testament says you must do. You and I must labor any way that we can right now where God has us so that the fullness of Jesus Christ ultimately can be seen through our little church. We're swept up into something really big. Let's pray.
Father in heaven, would you please just help us to understand this more and more? Lord, we have spent time on this, in this passage, and it feels still even to me like just scratching the surface of what that actually means. How on earth are we the fullness of your son? How do we get filled up? How do we reach the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ? Really, is it, is it by us just being equipped for humble acts of service, Lord? This can leave us just scratching our heads thinking, how does that connect with the big thing? But Lord, what we wanna do is we wanna trust you that it achieves the building up of the body. And Father, I pray for those who are maybe come from an experience where they're not sure they really wanna connect their lives to a local church, whether it's this one or another one. Father, there are terrible experiences to have out there in local churches. We had some of our own. But I pray, God, that you would take these words from your Bible and help them to be so prominent in the mind of the one struggling to commit to the local church that would push out all of those bad experiences and help them to see that no matter what the body is, no matter the scars on it, no matter the limitations on it, the the hobbling of that church, they must commit themselves to it. They must be equipped. They must build up the body so that the fullness of our Savior is seen. Father, take this church, grow us in these things. Help us to see the exalted Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to know him better and better and better. He is our ascended king and he deserves all the glory now that the local church, that this local church can give him. May our fullness, as you grow us spiritually, somehow point a lost world around us to him that they might see the one who will fill all things. And it's in his great name we pray, amen.